This is the city of Nicosia. It is the largest city, the capital, and seat of the government of Cyprus. It is also the southernmost of all EU member states' capitals, at a distance of 2,901 km southwest from Brussels. This is roughly the same distance as to Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, which is 2,960 km south. There is also a town in Sicily, in southern Italy, with the same name, meaning that the distance between Nicosia and Nicosia is 1,718 km. As of 2020, the population is roughly around 200,000 people, broadly divided into two main ethnic communities, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, who share many cultural traits but maintain distinct identities based on ethnicity, religion, language. So Cyprus as a whole is a rather multi-ethnic place with people from all over the world. Cyprus and Nicosia also happen to have a very rich history. Few places in the world have had such a long continuity of historic background with Hellenic people inhabiting the region for thousands of years, while the oldest and most impressive remnants that you can still see in Nicosia would be the Selimunia Mosque, historically known as the Cathedral of Saint Sophia. According to sources, it may have been the largest church built in the Eastern Mediterranean at the time. Initially, it served as a Roman Catholic cathedral and was converted into a mosque in 1570, with the start of the Ottoman rule in the region. The next most impressive remnant of history you can still see would be the Venetian walls, the construction of which started in 1567, prompted by the fears of a possible and eventually realized Ottoman invasion. However, what arguably defines Nicosia the most today is the ceasefire zone, running through the middle of the city, known as the Green Line, where modern shops and restaurants end suddenly with barbed wire. The course of this line through Nicosia corresponds to the natural path of Padeus River, but the line separates much more than just the city. The line is drawn to divide the whole island of Cyprus, dividing it between the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot populations, creating a facto two-state system in the nation. The northern part belongs to the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, a state recognized only by Turkey, considered as occupied territory by international community and officially a part of the Republic of Cyprus. And south of the border is the Republic of Cyprus, with a majority Greek Cypriot population. A fascinating example of how the country has been split can be seen at the location of the old Nicosia airport, which is now mainly used as the headquarters of the United Nations peacekeeping force. The airport was the scene of some of the heaviest fighting between Cypriot and Turkish forces, and so was turned into a part of the demilitarized zone. To this day, Nicosia as a capital has no airport. A new airport in Larnaca was opened in 1975, while Northern Cyprus established Erkan International Airport in 2004. But Erkan is not considered by the government of Cyprus as a legal entry or exit point. Flights from it go only to Turkey just one example of how the island has been split. Within the EU, there is no other urban area that offers as vivid a picture of intercultural conflict and the divide between East and West as in Nicosia. So how did this happen? Why has this ancient city been split in two? And how has this changed the lives of Nicosia's inhabitants? The relationship leading up to today arguably started in 1570, when an Ottoman army marched towards Nicosia and laid siege to the city. The city managed to last 40 days until its fall. The demographics of the country were changed considerably by Ottoman and ruled thereafter, from a predominantly Greek population to Greek majority and the Turkish minority population. For the next three centuries, Cyprus was under the rule of the Ottomans. During this time, an ethnic distinction was created based on religious and cultural affiliations. A privileged Muslim minority community distinguished its interests from the traditionally Greek population. Commercial and social relations between ethnic groups were open and active. Although all could prosper under the Ottoman administration, the system favored Muslims and spread ethnic segregation, and as such the Greeks and the Turks rarely lived together in harmony. In the aftermath of the Russo-Turkish War and the Congress of Berlin, Cyprus was leased to the British Empire in 1878 in exchange for guarantees that Britain would use the island as a base to protect the Ottoman Empire against possible Russian aggression. The island would serve Britain as a key military base to protect its trade routes to India through the Suez Canal. The Ottomans retained ownership over the island, but it was placed under British command. World War I allowed Britain to consolidate its holdings in the former Ottoman Empire, as the two nations were on opposite sides of the war. Therefore, Cyprus was formally annexed by Britain in 1914. Ever since the independence of Greece, which came about in the 1830s, the majority of the Greek Cypriots had been calling for what was known as Enosis, a union with Greece. After World War II, Britain started going through a period of decolonization, as it could no longer justify holding on to many of its overseas territories. However, when it came to Cyprus, it was too valuable as the Royal Air Force was able to reach three separate continents. 
while Greek-speaking Cypriots in favor of Enosis often rioted against the British rule. The Turkish minority were quite content with it and they were not in favor of Enosis. Despite pronounced tensions, approximately 37,000 Greek and Turkish-speaking Cypriot volunteers served in several branches of the British armed forces during World War II, hoping their contributions might earn Cyprus an opportunity for self-determination. Many were encouraged by the British wartime slogan for Greece and freedom. These expectations were not realized. Seeking to legitimize a permanent presence on the island, the British colonial authorities started pursuing policies in Cyprus that emphasized ethnic divisions, contributing to the growth of inter-ethnic rivalries. Anti-British sentiment amongst Greek-speaking Cypriots intensified in 1954, the year the British transferred the Middle Eastern headquarters from Egypt to Cyprus. This shift dramatically decreased the likelihood of Cyprus' union with Greece. From 1955 onwards, Greek and Greek-speaking Cypriot paramilitary activities focused on disrupting the British colonial administration through a campaign of bombings and assassinations. In May 1955, Ioka, a Greek Cypriot nationalist guerrilla organization, was formed and attacked police stations in Nicosia and Kyrenia. The ultimate goal was a union with Greece and the removal of the British presence on the island. It is useful to note that until the middle of 1955, violence between Cypriots was minimal. The conflict was predominantly anti-colonial in character. Now aware of the potentially disruptive impact of Enosis and Ioka on the power balance, Britain offered more vocal support for Turkish claims in order to counterbalance the increasingly radical nationalistic sentiments amongst Greek-speaking Cypriots. Gradually this effort to replace anti-colonial violence with inter-ethnic violence succeeded. Greek and Turkish Cypriots became progressively sealed off from one another and divided. The first serious attacks between Turkish and Greek-speaking Cypriots took place in 1956, resulting in the formation of Vulcan, a paramilitary group operated by the Turkish Cypriots. British military personnel installed barbed wire fencing and checkpoints in May 1956 to prevent clashes between the Turkish and Greek factions. It was the first of series of steps leading to the permanent physical division of Nicosia. It was the temporary semi-official boundary dividing Greek and Turkish-speaking Cypriots. From there on, at least five distinct agendas contributed to the overall worsening of the situation in Cyprus. First, Britain's efforts to retain its strategic position and avoid wider regional conflict. Cyprus's efforts to get rid of British administration Greece's efforts to retain cultural and political influence in Cyprus, Turkey's efforts to protect its southern border, and the US's efforts to block the ascendancy of the Communist Party in Cyprus and preserve access to its surveillance facilities and military installations on the island. As it happened, the British and the US goals could be achieved by partitioning Cyprus. A stronger Turkish presence would prevent communist infiltration, and Britain could more easily remain in control with Greek and Turkish Cypriots being distracted fighting each other. Throughout the summer of 1958, violence between Greek and Turkish-speaking Cypriots deteriorated the situation. Tensions in and around the capital were high, prompting British military personnel to impose evening curfews and maintain the strict separation. As new plans were made to try to resolve the Cyprus issue, fighting between the Greek and Turkish-speaking Cypriots grew in intensity. In 1959, the first phase of the Cypriot civil conflict began. The military dispute concluded in February after negotiations between Greek, Turkish and British diplomats. 18 months later, a new country formally asserted itself as a member of the United Nations under the leadership of the Greek Orthodox Archbishop Makarios III, first president of the Independent Republic of Cyprus. At this point, nobody really wanted an independent Cyprus. Greek Cypriots supported union with Greece and the Turkish Cypriots supported a partition. It was a compromise made not in the interest of Cyprus. As a result, however, Britain managed to retain two large military bases, maintaining some of its strategic control, and in reality, Turkey, Greece and Britain all had major control in the country. Cyprus was also restricted from forming a union with Greece, and it was explicitly prohibited from being partitioned. Cyprus had really backed into political independence from a position of desperation. It adopted somewhat democratic framework for national government without having first achieved national integration. Instead of redeeming the country, the new constitution brought on the darkest periods of civil strife in the island's history. By late 1963, the constitutional frameworks by which the country was to function had been abandoned in the face of escalating conflict. Widespread rioting, especially in the mixed suburbs in Nicosia, prompted an intervention by the British forces. The most hardline Yoka members no longer just targeted British forces, but they were also gunning for the undesirable Turkish population. As in 1955, chaotic conditions and the nature of inter-ethnic violence in late 1963 prompted the British soldiers to erect temporary physical barricades Soon after, it became permanent as the Green Line in the December of 1963. 
Meanwhile, a United Nations peacekeeping force arrived in Cyprus on March 1964 at the request of the British Cypriot representatives, as the island was on the brink of an all-out civil war, or worse, a war between Greece and Turkey. The peacekeeper arrival was punctuated with the construction of barbed wire fences, roadblocks, trenches and other fortifications, crisscrossing the island, with a special emphasis on the Green Line as it passed through Nicosia. At the time, the possibility of the existence of the Green Line for more than 50 years would have been inconceivable, as it was only meant to end hostilities temporarily while a long-term solution was found. The formal establishment of the Green Line lowered the intensity and frequency of violence in Nicosia, and by 1968, many could return home after being displaced by violence. During the 1960s, Cyprus as a whole remained populated by a majority of Greek Cypriots, and a common misconception is that it was already divided. This was not the case. The ratio between Turkish and Greek Cypriots was fairly evenly distributed throughout the island, of 82% to 18%, which was only changed later on. In 1974, a coup was orchestrated by the Greek government and executed by soldiers of Cyprus National Guard against President Makarios, where on the 15th of July they installed a former paramilitary commander, Nikos Samson, in his place. Samson was a zealous advocate of Enosis and was widely assumed to have been responsible for the murder of many Turkish Cypriot civilians during earlier stages of the civil conflict. It was later also revealed that the CIA was aware of the plot against Makarios but did nothing to stop it as this rather benefited the US agenda, seeing as Makarios was perceived to have been connected with communism. The Turkish government was troubled by the sudden progress of events in Nicosia and promptly invoked its concern for the welfare of isolated Turkish Cypriots, invoking its responsibilities as one of the three guarantors to the 1960s constitution. And without any intervention coming from Greece or Britain, Turkey decided to apply military force. By 22nd of July 1974, Operation Attila was launched, occupying about 3% of the island's territory. An emergency meeting was called by the UN Security Council, which failed to achieve any meaningful results. International opinion supported the initial Turkish action insofar as it served to protect the Turkish Cypriots, but condemned the brutality with which it was conducted. However, as the coup government was dissolved, there was no excuse for the Turkish army to press on with the invasion. A couple of weeks later, Turkey controlled about 37% of the island as it launched Operation Attila II. Hundreds of thousands of Cypriot civilians, still living on the potentially hostile side of the Green Line, were now compelled to cross it, in a final push for a near-perfect ethnic divide of northern and southern sectors of the island. Before foreign governments could formulate even a basic response to these events, the political landscape in Cyprus had shifted dramatically, and the world had witnessed an unprecedented military invasion of a neutral country by a NATO member state on the behalf of a minority ethnic group. The Turkish intervention continues to be viewed by advocates as a defensive maneuver on behalf of Turkish-speaking Cypriots, while detractors consider it an illegal act of foreign aggression against a sovereign nation. The Turkish Cypriots who had suffered from 1964 felt liberated, while 200,000 Greek Cypriots found their land invaded and themselves homeless, living in tents for the whole summer of 1974. As a result, several thousand Greek Cypriots were killed, hundreds disappeared, and about 70% of the island's productive capacity fell into the hands of the Turkish army. It cemented the terms of the prolonged political stalemate in Cyprus that has yet to be broken to this day, leaving us in this precarious position. In the politically turbulent years that followed 1974, the non-occupied South had to rebuild itself materially, as it had lost most of its productive capacity. It is theorized that the invasion could have been stopped through the intervention of the US forces. However, they allowed the invasion to commence, as they supported the partition of the island being more concerned with the Cold War and preventing a communist government from forming in Cyprus. In 1983, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus was proclaimed, and more and more Turkish people were encouraged to settle in the northern part of the island. Very few reliable studies regarding the impact of the partition on Nicosia have been conducted. While both parties to the conflict have collected statistics regarding the loss of life and property, it is typical for each group to count only the loss incurred in its own ethnic community, while ignoring and minimizing the losses resulting from violence for which they are responsible. Loss of life among Cypriots, Turkish military personnel, and British military personnel since the beginning of the civil strife has been substantial, and the partition in Nicosia led to major inefficiencies. The Green Line had transformed the center of the historic city, its most vibrant and cooperative sector, into to a no man's land to be taken over by vegetation. Beginning in 1964 and accelerating after 1974, Greek and Turkish authorities
authorities in Nicosia were obliged to develop new commercial centers in the southern and northern outskirts of the city. This duplication of institutions, facilities and services is a defining characteristic of the divided city, resulting in hasty and redundant urban development undertaken to accommodate ethnic separation. Nicosia Airport, mentioned earlier, being just one of them. Inter-ethnic violence was devastating for a Cypriot economy that had relied on industries like tourism and agriculture that are especially sensitive to political instability. And the internal displacement of a large segment of the workforce only compounded the problem, making the economic decline much more sharply felt, especially by the Turkish Cypriots whose government was not recognized outside of Turkey and was restricted from the normal trade relations. The prospect of increased productivity and higher standards of living is the strongest argument in favor of unification today. The Cyprus problem has become a breakpoint issue for EU accession talks with Turkey. On the one hand, Turkey is not willing to ratify the EU customs treaty and open its ports and airports to the Republic of Cyprus because it does not recognize Cyprus administration. On the other hand, it insists that international sanctions against Northern Cyprus be loosened. Northern Cyprus is still neither a country nor a federal region nor a colonial territory and it is denied existence on any non-Turkish Cypriot map. It still has no postal code nor coordinates for air or sea traffic, being seen and treated simply as a place occupied by the Turkish army. As of April 2003, civilians are able to cross from one side to the other. On either side, the checkpoint buildings that permit the travel are covered with posters, graffiti and statements which reflect the two sides' positions on the Cyprus problem. The physical construction of the checkpoints in the center of Nicosia is itself revealing. The Greek Cypriot checkpoint is built as a small temporary construction, whereas the Turkish Cypriot checkpoint is a large concrete two-story structure with a banner on top proclaiming Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus forever. Turkish Cypriots, whose goal is separation, constructed a historical narrative placing emphasis on events of conflict and violence between the two sides, focusing on Greek Cypriot aggression, especially during the 1960s and often deeper into the past. In this way, future separation is legitimized through the argument that past proves that the two people cannot live together, while Greek Cypriots who desire reunification have placed emphasis on past events of cooperation, constructing a historical narrative whereby the two ethnic groups are said to have peacefully co existed and also of course on the fact that the Republic of Cyprus should have sovereign right over the whole island, especially considering the fact that North Cyprus was mostly inhabited by Greek Cypriots until 1974 invasion. No resolution has been found and there is a worry that Turkish influence is creeping into the country and then if a solution for unification is not found soon, then Northern Cyprus may be fully integrated into Turkish territory. As Greece and Turkey are currently at an impasse of their rights over the Mediterranean Sea, the acquisition of Northern Cyprus would greatly bolster Turkey's claim to Mediterranean waters and its resources. For obvious reasons, this would be a great result for Turkey, and this must at least partially explain Turkey encouraging its people to settle in northern Cyprus shortly after the partition. Despite the existence of its geopolitical pretext, Nicosia of today is a rather peaceful and thriving capital with high standards of living. Nicosia is considered one of the safest cities in the world, perceived to be about as safe as Amsterdam and significantly safer than Brussels. The sewage system in Nicosia is, is a famous example of the possibility of working together on joint project. It was the largest bi-communal cooperation on the island taking place after 1974, meaning that while Nicosia is divided above ground, it is joined underground. For the younger generation of Cypriots, the past is becoming less relevant and hopefully it will not take another 50 years for mutual understanding to resolve the Cyprus problem and Nicosia may be whole once again. This is the high resolution map of Cyprus that you may have seen in this video. If you would like to have it as your desktop wallpaper, please come down to Patreon and support me. Or you may also come down to our website where I'll be selling this map and others as high quality prints. Now I hope I did justice covering this incredibly complicated topic. Whatever piece of history I skipped or forgot, just leave a comment and let me know how bad and terrible my video is. Please subscribe, check the bell button, Geoperspective out.